What's the word, y'all? Hey, when was the last time y'all got a video like right after the games ended? Like I always record these videos after the games end, but like right after, as far as publishing, it don't happen very often. But when the first game starts at noon, and then it's all wrapped up by 6 o'clock. Hey, I can come in here and record night in, night out, man. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe. Let's talk about the second round of the playoffs. Two games. Milwaukee beats the Boston Celtics and the Warriors close it out in Memphis. Two road teams take home court advantage. And we're going to start off with the first game of the day. I'm trying my very best to, to watch this as a fan, but also remember that I got to record these videos. Because I think that earlier in the playoffs, round one, I would watch these videos strictly as a fan. Then I forget about everything that happened in it just because I'm so in the moment. I'm so excited about it. But I had a lot of notes about this one. And you know what? Let, let me say this right off rip before we even get to the video. Just because I predicted that my, my prediction was this team is going to win and they end up losing. This is not my team. I'm a... I'm a, I'm a neutral fan here. <laughs> I don't care if my predictions are right or wrong, y'all. I'm not rooting for the Celtics because I picked the Celtics to win the series. I'm not rooting for the Warriors because I picked the Warriors to win. I just want good basketball. And we got that one way or another. I'm just saying that. You feel me? I don't really care. I just had to make a prediction for the video. You know prediction videos do a lot better than anything else. Anyway, the Milwaukee Bucks went into Boston, and it was a dogfight from the very beginning. It was great defense on both sides, man. They were talking about on the broadcast how Jason Tatum had a lot of goals, and one of them is to be an all-defensive player, and he was playing so great defensively. Drew Holiday was getting in all people's stuff. But listen. <laughs> there's one person I'm giving my MVP award in every one of these games there's one person that deserves the MVP award he has six points didn't hit a three didn't make it to the free throw line shot three of seven my MVP of today's game Milwaukee boss is Brooke Lopez I had made the joke before during the Bulls series that Brooke Lopez is Hakeem Olajuwon Brooke Lopez is Hakeem Olajuwon defensively bro they had, I told y'all in the preview of this series that the Bucks are going to pack the paint and let people shoot. And I saw somebody on Twitter like, man, the Celtics only want to shoot threes today. No, that's not what they want to do. That's all they can do because that's the way the Milwaukee Bucks plays defense. They took 50 threes. The, the Boston Celtics took 50 threes because anytime they got any dribble penetration and tried to go up, it was Brook Lopez at the rim. He only had three blocks today, but I promise you if they counted like, the shots that he contested that ended in the miss, he would have had a double-double. Du double. Let's let's add that stat. Let's add another stat. Actually, Kirk Goldsberry has it right here. I just refreshed Twitter and it was the first thing that popped up. The Celtics shot just 3 of 20 from the field when Giannis and or Brook Lopez contested the shot, including 1 for 15 on two-pointers. And I will say, majority of those two-pointers are like get into the rim and Brook Lopez say a no. Or Jason Tatum trying to do a little size of midi and, and Giannis say a no. The defense was absolutely amazing. And I would say that the defense was pretty good on both sides of the ball, but... You saw the Milwaukee Bucks had some of the others, which is what we talked about in that series, step up a little bit more. Because though Giannis had 24 points, he had a triple-double today with 12 assists and 13 rebounds. I think that the that the Boston Celtics did a pretty good job guarding him individually. Of course, we had to lob to a self, which is fine. I think they did a pretty good job defending him individually, but what they lacked was making those rotations once he made the next pass. And the next pass was hitting Grayson Allen, and the next pass was hitting Drew Holiday, who had a magnificent game offensively and defensively. So they need to figure out how to... A, neutralize, because you're not going to stop Giannis. I'm going to keep saying neutralize or or deter him from having a, a, a dominant scoring performance, but also find a way to get back on the shooters and stuff. It's going to be hard, because in order to stop Giannis, you probably send in two bodies. And how do we rotate? Because Giannis's progression as an NBA player went from, who is this guy getting drafted? So, oh, we can kind of see, oh, Jason Kidd got him playing point guard. That's kind of cool. Most improved player to MVP, to defensive player of the year. And now the next step in his progression has been his... His playmaking, and this has been happening over the last couple seasons. This is nothing new. I'm not super surprised that he can make these passes, but that was part of his progression to become a, a well above average passer. And as one thing that I guess I could say that he had he has done better than Kevin Durant did last series. Like the way they guarded Giannis was similar to Kevin Durant. And I thought they would do it a little bit differently, but it was very similar. But with Kevin Durant, he didn't he doesn't have maybe the same vision that Giannis had, at least today, to find the shooters and and Kevin Durant didn't have the same shooters <laughs> that Giannis has. Either way, I think that the defense on both sides are pretty good. There, there's a lot of sloppiness here. Here goes some of my notes. My notes say Brook Lopez became Elijah Wan, and I hope y'all don't take that too serious. I'm just kind of showcasing that he's a great center defensively. He's not Hakeem. I, okay, you understand that, but I know there's two percent of people that didn't. Next one says only shooting threes. We talked about that, right? They weren't only shooting threes because they want to. It was because that's what the Bucks gave them. Transition defense. 
this is the first time in like two months, three months where I saw the Boston Celtics. I remember the Boston Celtics getting slapped in the face. The, the Milwaukee Bucks were a way more physical team today. And with that physicality, they got out and ran. They got out and ran. And it seemed like the Boston Celtics had no answer to when they started to run. And the Milwaukee Bucks have been a team that ran and they'll pull up on the, the three. Drew Holiday's pulling up for three. Or Pat Connors is pulling up for three. Or Grayson Allen pulling up for three. They don't really necessarily go for the easiest basket. They go for the one that they feel confident with. And they got a ton of fast break points. 28 to 8. They dubbed them in fast break points today. Unacceptable for the Boston Celtics, who had been such a great defensive team on getting back, you know, in transition. Today, they just didn't do it. Nothing easy for the ball handlers. Yes, that's another great thing. I talked about Drew Holiday and his excellence today. Um, in, in the preview, I was saying that the Bucs cannot afford to have a bad Drew Holiday offensive game. And today, he ended up with 25 points. Uh, but when I say uh, nothing easy for the ball handlers, I mean that so literal, bro. Anytime somebody brought the ball up the court, soon as they hit half court, it was Grayson, it was Drew, it was Javon, it was Pat. Anybody that was guarding the ball handler, they really got in on it. You know, and I'm thinking early fourth quarter, there was a play where Grayson Allen was trying to pick somebody up 94 feet. And he got all the way there. He ended up committing a foul, but it was just like that rigged, great defense. And I don't think the Boston Celtics were really uh, prepared for that. I knew that Javon Carter, if he was going to get big minutes, he was going to go out there and try to defend his butt off because that's what he does. That's what he's done his entire life. And the Boston Celtics got to see that in the hardest way possible. Jason Tatum was, try Jason Tatum was trying to start the offense at like – you, he was at, what is it, Lucky? Is that the guy's name that Kyrie stumped on? <laughs> the leprechaun? Is it Lucky the leprechaun? He was trying to start the offense that far back because he get, couldn't get any closer because Drew Holiday, because Javon Carter and all these other perimeter defenders. And then the last thing on my notes for this game is just JB, and that ha that is uh, uh, Jalen Brown. Um, I did not realize that Jalen Brown was playing through injury. I, they talked about that on the broadcast. I, I didn't know from the first round. I guess they were so dominant in the first round and didn't recognize if he was laboring out there. Today, they allowed him to shoot pretty much any shot he wanted to. He got a ton of open looks, and they were not falling. And, and Jalen Brown being known as a two-way player, I thought his defense was lackluster today. And as a guy that's not known to be the primary ball handler, seven turnovers is unacceptable. And you look at some of those turnovers, it's like, oh, we got a rebound. We want to run. Oh, I, I, I threw it off the Bucks' foot, and now they got a layup on the other side of the ball. Uh, they just need him to be better. They need him to be the all-star caliber player that he can be. You, you got uh, Marcus Smart going through a million injuries. I thought that he tore his shoulder, dislocated his shoulder, because, listen, I have had, I have torn both of my shoulders, <laughs> one of them multiple times. That lean to the, to the locker room to help, I've done that. Freshman year high school, I've done that. You feel me? At uh, what school were we at? I don't remember what school we were at. It was a road game, and I literally just walked off the floor, and my coach is like, you're going to need a substitution, huh? Hell yeah, coach. My, you can see the back of, if you look at the back of my, my shoulder, my bone is right there. Yes, I'm going to need a sub out. I think I also had 14 points in the first half of that game. So he was like, ah, it was at Fenton. If you know, uh, Fenton, I did it at Fenton. Either way, I, I knew that walk and I was like, dang, he, gonna dis he dislocated the shoulder. But what some people don't know about dislocated shoulders, you can just pop that joint back in and go back to hoop. And, and a lot of the cases, not every case, but a lot of the cases, there's even times where I've dislocated my shoulder and it popped itself back in and I stayed in games. So like when I saw him go back to the locker room, I was like, oh, it's a dislocated shoulder, but he can probably come back into it. But they said it was just a stinger. And then he got kneed in the quad and now he got hit in the face. Marcus Smart was so big for them today when he went to the locker room where he wasn't on the court and it was Peyton Pritchard. It was just Derek White as a primary ball handler. The team suffered dramatically. The ball stopped moving and they could not get any baskets and didn't defend very well. So Hopefully, both of these players could get back healthy because, again, I want the best version of every team. And Chris Middleton not being there didn't really matter today. Didn't matter today. I can't say that that's going to be the case for the entire series. I think that Boston's going to wake up. And Ime Udoka has showed uh, in this short NBA career that he's a guy that can make adjustments. So I'm very curious to see what they try to do differently in game number two. Also, a Bud. Will Bud make any changes? Probably not. Bud is a great coach. But he's not a guy that usually steers too far away from what he normally does, you know? They're going to pack the paint again and be like, Peyton Pritchard, we're going to let you shoot again. Or Grant Williams, we're going to let you shoot again and all the other people. So, uh, one hell of a game. It didn't end up that way. I guess the end of the fourth quarter got away and then they pulled starters. But for three and a half quarters, this, is a, this was a banger. But the real banger was the Warriors versus the Memphis Grizzlies. Jeez, bro. Yes, sir. This, is, this was a great great game and I saw somebody on Twitter say this and it's facts Jordan Poole had 31 
Uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. had 33. Ja had 34. That's three people that put up 30 plus points. And I think they're all under the age of 23, I think is what the tweet says, um, which is which is great. Right. We got some good performances. Uh, I mentioned that Jaron Jackson Jr. was basically my most disappointing player in the first round because I know what he can be offensively and defensively, but he didn't stay on the floor but if you look at game six versus the wolves and game one versus the warriors he did a phenomenal job not being in foul trouble and it led to him playing 31 minutes and then the shot fell this uh the beginning of this series that can be dangerous for the warriors because i feel like one of the warriors game plans like he's a high volume low efficiency three-point shooter and we'll live with those and today they end up getting a win obviously but he shot, he shot the ball extremely well. He had some heat check moments with that look here jump shot, and it was going in. And I, I got to give a lot of credit to well, – actually, actually, one of my notes says Dylan Brooks just be shooting. Literally, my notes say Dylan Brooks just be shooting. And that's facts. But I do want to give him a lot of credit because he was playing with five fouls in his game. And a lot of times when somebody's playing with five fouls, obviously they become like a – a revolving door. They're trying their hardest not to get that sixth foul. Bro drew a charge. He was diving on the floor still to get jump balls. He did a lot of different things that might not show up on the stat sheet with five fouls that kept them into this game. He also shot a couple bonehead shots in the fourth quarter that might have got them out of the game, but still got a lot of love for uh, Dylan Brooks. We did not get a Desmond Bain game, and I think that might have been the missing piece, man, because I feel like they had control of this game a lot. The officiating in both of these games were questionable. Again, I'm not a guy to usually talk about officiating, but there are a couple moments in this game specifically where I'm like, Ref's kind of bugging. The one with Clay Thompson misses both free throws and the ball goes out of bounds, obviously on Dylan Brooks' hands, and they like, we ain't see it. Let's jump the ball. I'm like, oh, that's a bit iffy. Um, but it, it ended up being what it was being. Uh, the, the goal for the Warriors are like, we're going to let John Moran shoot. We're going to let Jaron shoot because we don't necessarily trust them. We trust Desmond Bain's shot, so we're going to contest that. We trust some of the other people's shots, so we're going to contest that. Um, but Ja tr tried to make him pay. He had his first two threes of the game. He had another one down the stretch in the fourth quarter, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that was big. But I think that he fell in love with it just a little bit too much. I think he fell in love with it just a little bit too much. He had a great game. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that they lost his game because John Moran took three extra threes that he probably shouldn't. No, that's not what I'm saying. But I do I do believe that once you see a couple go win, you're like, oh, I can make this shot all the time. And obviously, he's better when he's going downhill, going downhill, going downhill. He had a phenomenal game. I love that DeAnthony Melton played his way back into the rotation. And I'm hoping to see more minutes from him in game number two um, because... He, he basically didn't get a lot of PT at the end of the Timberwolves series because he struggled offensively and defensively. And today, him, him putting up 14 points and his rebounds, he got a couple steals, which is great. But where they lacked the most in this game, especially in the fourth quarter, was their rebounding. The Warriors aren't even known as a team that gets a lot of offensive rebounds because a lot of times they're playing small with Draymond, who got ejected, by the way. I guess we'll talk about that in a minute. They run small. Kevon Looney don't usually play a lot of fourth quarter minutes. So not, they're not a team that kills the offensive glass. But in this game, they did. And I was thinking, like, okay, how about we just – I'm saying we as if I'm part of the coaching staff for the for the Memphis uh, Grizzlies. Why don't we just put Steven Adams in the game? Steven Adams got – the C word. I didn't know that. I didn't know he was in health and safety protocol. I did not get that update on my phone. I just Googled it after the game, Stephen Adams, and yeah, he, he was health and safety protocol right now. They could have used him. Um, I don't think there's a series where Stephen Adams won't play at all like the last one against the Timberwolves, just because there are going to be minutes where he's matched up with Kevon Looney, and Kevon Looney don't got the foot speed that Carthony Towns does that they were trying to take advantage of. Kevon Looney ended up playing 20 minutes this game, basically, and had eight points and some offensive rebounds down the stretch. So, uh, when Steven Adams comes back, they're going to def definitely need him to play at least a little bit. You, the, the Warriors did their thing, man. Klay Thompson missed those free throws, and I was so surprised. But even though he didn't have a great shooting night, he hit the biggest one of the game, the one that was the game clincher. Again, he missed the free throws after that, but he hit the game clincher. And I would love – I hope that these are up. Hold on. They are uh, beautiful. I have a couple moments um, like time frames in this game that I wrote down that I want to show y'all the clips of. I don't completely remember why I picked these moments, uh, but I guess we're going to watch them live by ourselves. I don't really remember why I saved this moment, but here we go. Let's figure out on the fly. Uh, Three-point game for the Golden State War. Oh, this is the moment. This is why. You know how much respect you got to have on a player. Watch this. He pump fakes five feet outside the three-point line and got bro to jump. And stepped in and then hit a basically a double contested three. That's insane. That's the one of the greatest shooters of all time. That you legit have to guard him right here on the catch. Got Tyus up in the air and then hit the shot. That's why I saved that moment. Klay Thompson. That's a big three right there. I don't remember why I saved this one, but it's the fourth quarter as well. Um, it's an eight-point game in the Warriors' favor at the moment. I know I'm blocking it, but it's an eight-point game in the Warriors' favor. Let's see why I saved this one. 
Okay, dribble to or handoff to Jordan Poole. And then, oh, yeah, it was the pass. It was the pass. Because I didn't even mention how, how good Jordan Poole has been. Look at this pass. Look, look how much John Morant's not even really paying attention. He's standing upright. And just to have the confidence to throw that pass and then boom. Because he got, he drew the double right here in the corner. That that's a, that's a crazy play. It's a crazy play. I mean, is it crazy enough for me to put into the video? Probably not, but still. Oh, and then the last play was the the game tying or the one uh, that could have not game tying. This would have won the game. Um, and the reason I saved this one is because Clay Thompson knew exactly what was going to be ran immediately and committed. He committed. Usually, this is a, a commitment that Draymond Green would make, but Klay Thompson ended up being the guy. Watch, watch, watch the defensive possession from Klay Thompson. Right now, he's on Brandon Clark, right? Ball inbound to Brandon Clark. He sees Josh streaking up. He does not give a damn about Jordan Clark's, um, I'm sorry, <laughs> Brandon Clark right now. He like, I know where Ja is going. He's Ja Morant. I know exactly what they're running. And this is great play call from, um, from Taylor Jenkins because if they had a couple more seconds, which they probably should have had a couple more seconds, but the refs, again, was kind of bugging. This is maybe a bucket. And you see Klay Thompson commit. I mean, you can make an argument that maybe a little bit of arm down low, but still, that's a great defensive possession from, from Klay Thompson. He knows... I damn near choked this game. We're missing two free throws and 85% career three, a free throw shooter. But, hey, at least I got the defensive stop that clinched this game for us. And now we steal home court advantage. We got one more here in Memphis, and then we go home to the Bay. I can't say this enough how impressed I am with the way Jordan Poole has performed in his first playoff appearance. It's not easy to, to hit the playoffs for the first time and perform as he is. Um, and maybe it's easier because he has Steph Curry and Klay Thompson on his team, which opens the game up a lot more. But he still has to be out there doing his thing. He still has to be out there making shots. Or in the case I just showed you in that video, being able to play make as well. Bro, I'm so very impressed with him. Nine assists, eight rebounds, almost a triple double. And he, he was he was phenomenal tonight. He was phenomenal tonight. They even got Gary Payton a second to start for the John Moran assignment. Um, and I thought he played okay defense, even though John Moran, again, ended up with 30-something as well. Um, but just, went, wow, what, what a great group of games. And I wished, I know it's not possible because it's Monday tomorrow. I wish that a lot of these games started this early. But then again, we'd have a baseball situation where, like, why are we starting games at 11 a.m. on a Monday? So, yeah, maybe not. But still, enjoyed the hell out of these games. How are y'all feeling? What are y'all temperatures after game number one, are y'all feeling pretty confident about the Bucks being able to close the series out eventually or the Warriors closing the series out eventually? Let me know.